Imagine this, everyone. One of your siblings or your loved ones just disappears. You get to the point where you don't even dare ask because supposedly they're doing God's work. And if you don't know, then you're not worthy to know. So don't dare. Don't even try to wonder or ask where they've gone. Welcome back everyone, my name is Sam. And I'm Melissa. I grew up in the FLDS community. It is a polygamous group run by Warren Jeffs and I moved out when I was 18 years old. I was raised LDS, Sam and I have been married for nine years and have two awesome kiddos. Yes we do. Today we are going to be reviewing and reacting to, it's a new series called Secrets of Polygamy. Yeah, we're gonna be reviewing the first episode today. This is heartbreaking. I feel like this one feels so much closer to home than a lot of the other ones that we review. You know, even other polygamous groups, I feel like there's that little bit of separation, like they're related and we can talk about it and talk about the similarities between the FLDS and these other groups like the LeBarons, which are also horrific. But this one, like, because it's so similar to stuff that we talk about that's within Sam's group and yeah. that he has family in and the way that his own family's impacted. I don't know, it's yeah, really different. Well, and this show isn't just similar to, it is about the FLDS community where I come from. So it's about Warren Jeffs and things he was doing and it's about Samuel Bateman and the things he was doing. And we're, there's a lot to talk about here, but very scary stuff. So just a trigger warning there that there are things that go on within these communities that are very harmful to families and children. Yes, and so this, Documentary is a little bit different in the sense that they're kind of following around an investigator named Matt Browning mm. and he's going around and trying to find out more because he talked about the fact that in his journey uh, he was in law enforcement and he has been able to build relationships with people who are leaving the FLDS and so more people have started calling him and his journey kind of starts with the fact that people were calling needing help finding their children. Now, if, if anyone hasn't seen the videos that we've done about the missing children, I will leave a link above about what a problem that is within the FLDS community right now. Um, but he's going around and he's trying to find answers as to where these children could be and what exactly is going on is kind of the focus of this first episode. Right. Yes, and uh, I, I feel that they do a pretty good job. They get to talk with people that were very much involved in all of the things going on from a long time ago, many years ago, and still some things that are going on today while these so-called prophets are in prison and, and they still continue to control and command their followers. Yeah, so the first people that he went to is he said he had a relationship and, and knew Rachel Jeffs, who was one of Warren Jeffs' daughters. Mm -hmm. And Rachel has a book out. She's been on other shows before that we've seen and had come out publicly when she left about the yeah. abuse that her father um, had sexually abused her from the time that she was eight years old, you know, between the ages of eight and 16, finding out that, um, she, that her father had abused other sisters of hers is when kind of snapped her out and decided that she was going to leave because she had children. She had five children at the time and she had been taken away from them in houses of hiding um, and just decided that she couldn't do it anymore. She didn't want the things that happened to her to happen to her children. Right, and that's what it came down to is her children, right? It's interesting, or it's not interesting, but it's crazy how much a, us as humans can endure and how much we can take on. But when it comes to our children's safety and what we want, what's best for them, that's when it changes. And all of a sudden we become, we can speak for ourselves as parents, when it becomes all about the children, all of a sudden you have a lot more courage to do what needs to be done to make sure that they are protected. And it sounds like that's exactly what Rachel Jeffs did here because, uh, I mean, I can't, you can't blame anyone, especially a young girl like Rachel Jeffs, for being in it as long as she was. Mm -hmm. She felt completely powerless, completely powerless. Not only was this happening to her, this sexual abuse happening to her by her father, but it was happening to her by the prophet who thousands of people believed and still many, many do that he is speaking and doing exactly what God wants. Yeah, it broke my heart at one point. She said that when her sister had finally confided in her and said, you know what happened to you? That happened to me too. Mm -hmm. And she said, obviously she was horrified that it had happened to her sister as well. But then she said something that I think kind of goes off what you're talking about where she said, and it also made me realize this whole time it wasn't about something I had done. 
it was about him. Right. You know, this entire time, her entire life, she had been taught and basically raised to believe that somehow it must have been something that she did. And she said even the very first time it happened, she just thought, why, what could I have done to make him so angry that he would hurt me like that, right? And constantly thinking that it was something she had done, something she had done. And she goes, when I realized it was him and not me, was like another, you know, an eye-opening moment, which is just, I think that's another reason why Warren Jeffs can stay in power, right? Like he teaches people that it is their fault and that, you know, the second coming hasn't happened because the people aren't righteous enough. It's always the people's fault and it tends to fall on the mother's and the women's fault a lot and the men's too, honestly, all of their, like, but they're constantly being blamed for something and being told they're not perfect enough, always. Yeah, and some of the things, the abuses that Warren Jeffs would do, he would call it atoning, you know, and then he would, I, I think he would use that as, I am doing this because of the wickedness of my followers, and so God is requiring me to do this. I don't want to do it. It's the, God is making me do it. And he would get away with all of this stuff because he was doing it under the command of God. And of course, that would just make him seem like a greater person in, in his followers eyes, because, you know, he's telling us he doesn't want to do these things. It's not what he wants. It's just God is commanding him because this is the only way that the people can be saved and the Zion can be redeemed, as he would say. Yeah. I also found it interesting that Rachel's husband, who, again, I've seen Rachel on stuff before, but I've never seen her husband talk mm -hmm. and speak. And yeah. The fact that his experience in recognizing that he needed to leave also happened when he saw what was happening to his younger sister. Right. You know, his younger sister disappeared in the night, right, at 13. It was, was very common in those days. And this is interesting, too, because Rachel Jeff's husband now is a Blackmore, actually, and he comes from the Canadian group, the Blackmore group there in Canada, in Bountiful, I believe. Yeah, Bountiful. Uh, so anyway... That was a kind of a mysterious group to me my whole childhood because I knew they were very much involved and a part of the FLDS church, Winston Blackmore being the bishop up there and in charge of the group. I know they no longer, or at least I know Winston no longer believes in Warren Jeffs and has kind of started his own thing up there. But I think he's in prison now, isn't he? Is he I know he was. Or I don't he got know. in trouble with the law. Right, something going on up there. But yeah, once Warren Jeffs was caught, then it also sh shined a bright light on other places like Canada where FLDS people live. So I don't know for sure how they stand today, but it was a unique perspective, for me anyway, hearing from someone that came from that side of it. Yeah, and to hear that girls were disappearing from there as well as Short Creek, right? Because exactly. that was happening when you lived there that... People were just suddenly oh, disappearing from Zion. Cream. Oh, yes. Sisters, brothers, people would just poof. And where did they go? Oh, and it was like we almost started, I started feeling bad even asking. Like if someone just disappeared, imagine this, everyone. One of your siblings or your loved ones just disappears. You get to the point where you don't even dare ask because supposedly they're doing God's work. And if you don't know, then you're not worthy to know. So don't dare, don't even try to wonder or ask where they've gone. Yeah, and it wasn't until a few years later um, in the raid, in the Texas raid, when they found that his sister at 13 had gone there and had been married to Warren Jeffs. Mm -hmm. And so, and that was kind of his awakening as well. So kind of back to what you were saying where there's so much you can take as a, a person and you think, okay, like I can get through this or maybe you are very much to the point of thinking that you deserve it or you know everything's fine but then when you see your loved ones go through it whether it's your children whether it's a younger sister whether in Rachel's case it was you know a sister too going through the same thing you do that it snaps you out and goes whoa wait a minute right. this is happening to more than just me it's not just in my head it's yes everywhere and he was also talking about during the time that his sister was had disappeared that he was working a lot on the log on the logs and the kits to build the log homes that were then shipped off to Texas for the ranch there in Texas. So he was doing the building of these homes in a way for the Texas ranch where his sister had been sent off and was most likely being abused, not even really knowing. He didn't know where these homes were being built or what was going on. Kind of like me, he was left very much in the dark. 
which it seems to be a common theme too, like the compartmentalization, right? Mm -hmm. Where these guys over here are working hard to make the logs and make these kits and it's being sent somewhere and they don't know where, it's just for Zion, you know, and they don't really know all the details. And then there's people in Short Creek that are doing this, that, and they're canning food and they're doing this and it's for Zion, but we don't really know where, we don't really know what, like Warren really had all these different sections of people, these different groups of people doing all these things for whatever his master plan was while keeping everyone in the dark. So it wasn't ever like a, all they knew is that we're all doing it for Zion. Right. Yes. So it was very scary for a lot of people. And unfortunately, instead of kind of snapping out of it during those times, most people buckled down because they wanted to become worthy enough to know. They wanted to be in the know. And I had I had some of my own siblings that would suddenly become rather secretive about things. And and even though some of them didn't disappear and go to Texas, suddenly they just, you could just tell they were becoming mysterious. And I just, all I wanted is to be in the know. I just wanted to know what was going on. And I always felt inferior to the rest of those that were uh, aware of everything. And so it was just a weird time, very strange time. But uh, for those that believed in Warren Jeffs, it was a time to buckle down and try to be more obedient to him. Yeah, Rachel and Brandon did mention to, uh, to Matt about the fact that they had heard that there was stuff going on in North Dakota. And, you know, I feel like everyone in the community, and especially people who have left or even sources we've talked to, North Dakota is kind of this really mysterious thing place like even the stuff that we hear from trusted sources it's still no one fully knows Warren just is still able to keep so many things a secret and I like they said at one point in this episode you know that the more light that gets shown the harder it's going to be for Warren to keep his secrets right. because sometimes people might be like well what is the point in even talking about it what's the point of even talking about it on YouTube you know if no one's going to be able to find these kids anyway and they're just hiding them and Warren's great at hiding, but the more people know and the more people can watch out for, the less easy it's going to be for Warren to hide people. Exactly. And believe it or not, everyone, this, this North Dakota stuff and the secrets that I have referred to back in the day when they were, when they were building the Texas ranch, that kind of stuff is still going on today. Because I recently spoke with someone that is still following Warren Jeffs. I cannot say who, but they told me that they had no idea that anything was going on in North Dakota. And this has been going on for quite some time and people are still disappearing to North Dakota and other places. And children, yeah. And people that are still following faithful members of Warren Jeffs still don't know about a lot of what is going on. So it's not that every FLDS person you see in a store is going to be somehow a part of this master plan. Some of these people are still completely left in the dark, probably just as I was, hoping that one day they will be righteous enough to be in the know. Yeah. The second kind of storyline in this one after talking to Rachel and Brandon was then they went and talked to Faith um, Beistlein, I think it's Beist, Beistlein, yes. Beistlein. Yeah. and where they talked more about Samuel Bateman. Now, we had done a video with... Um, on a newscast, I believe. Again, I'll leave that link above right now if you want to go check out that video on Samuel Bateman. And we definitely want to do more on him in the future. Right now, he's in prison, as he should be, waiting for his trial. But this episode was probably the most detailed that we had gotten about what was going on with Samuel Bateman. Right. So we had talked before about the fact that we knew that he had kind of risen up and decided that he was now the prophet. This was the first time I had ever heard that Samuel Bateman was telling people Warren just isn't in prison. He's dead. And he came to me in a spirit, in spirit form, and told me that I'm to be the prophet. Had you ever heard that, babe? I had not heard that that's what he was telling people, but I did know that he was trying to convince a lot of Warren Jeff's followers to follow him and that he was the new prophet because uh, some, some of my own family members were confronted by him and asked to follow him, and he tried to convince them. Thankfully, at least the family no members that I know of didn't fall for it, but it sounds like a lot of people did. And Faith, that is talking to us here in this episode, she gives a lot of inside information, which is fantastic because I had never talked to someone that actually followed Sam Bateman until now. 
Yeah, and or, I've never heard of anyone. Sorry, I didn't. I didn't get a chance to talk to Faith, but <laughs> yeah, and she was talking about the fact that you know why is she talking out and speaking out? And she said her family, like all three of her mothers, are following him even though he's in prison. And she said something that I thought was really a good way to word it. You know, people all the time are like, "How can you follow a prophet who's in prison?" And you know, we've referenced other prophets that have been up against the law before. But she said yeah. it wasn't in spite of him being in prison, it was because he was in prison that we followed him so faithfully. What does that mean, babe, for people who are like, what? <laughs> well, it's because they become a martyr. They become this person that they end up in prison because the outside world is fighting against God's church. And so for the followers, and I can speak for myself when Warren Jeffs was put in prison, after getting over the shock that they actually caught him, it was a faith promoting experience to me because in my mind, just as I looked at Joseph Smith when he was incarcerated, I looked at, at, a, at Warren Jeffs as a martyr that was only put in prison because Satan was working against God's work. And so it didn't really phase my, at that time anyway, it didn't really phase my belief and faith in him. Yeah, and Faith talks about the fact that her older brother, Lud, had given multiple of mm -hmm. his underage daughters to Samuel Bateman as wives. And Samuel Bateman was caught um, actually on the freeway with underage girls in a trailer behind his who truck. Who claimed to be his wife. Who claimed to be his wives. One you know? was as young as 11 years old, it sounds like. Yeah, 11, 13, 14 she was talking about the fact that the affidavit, now I'm very curious if, if that's public knowledge, if that's something she was able to see or if that's public and we can find out more. But she was talking about the fact that he was atoning for the sins of the FLDS people. Yeah, and that goes back to Warren Jeffs as well, that they claim, and not only Warren Jeffs, but it looks like as we review these other groups, a lot of other people like the LeBarons are claiming to be atoning because the, the followers aren't righteous enough, so therefore someone has to stand up and claim to be this person that can take on the sins of the world or the sins of the group and somehow make it their mission to atone for their sins and by doing so get away with, as Samuel Bateman will hear in just a moment, very, very awful things that they were abused that they were doing to their followers. It's so like anti-Christian, I feel like, that it blows my mind that a group that can claim they're Christian can start believing that they can atone for sins like Jesus Christ. Like it seems blasphemous. It does. And at the yeah. same time, like it's it's becoming such a common trend in a lot of these polygamous groups. So it's so sad. And in this case, and all of them seem to atone in different ways, whether it's, you know, blood atonement, whether it's through heavenly sessions, like Warren Jeffs, yep. and in this case with Samuel Bateman. I have to wonder, this, this when they talked about what Samuel Bateman was doing to quote-unquote atone for the sins of the people, and he was saying that he was atoning for the sins of the FLDS people that wouldn't follow him. The ones that followed him were okay because they chose the right, but for those that were still believing that Warren Jeffs was alive in prison and following Warren Jeffs, he was supposedly atoning for their sins. He says he's atoning, but he was having other people do sexual acts with minors. Yeah. So Warren Jeffs did a similar thing where he would atone for sins and claim to be in all of this pain and be throwing himself around a room and and whatever. But during other stuff that he was forcing his followers to do, uh, sexual acts with and in front of him. And so it makes me wonder if Samuel Bateman figured out that that's what Warren Jeffs was doing somehow because he turned around and did basically the same thing in, except for he invited other men to come in and join him and basically have sexual intercourse in front of him with underage girls. Which oh, is so sickening. And yeah, calling them like the spiritual ceremonies for him to be able to have atonement. So for, and they said yeah. some girls as, as young as 12 participating in that. So, so glad he's in prison. We will definitely keep all of you updated on how that sentencing goes, that process as we learn more as his hearings and his trial start. We'll yeah. definitely be covering that because he needs to be put away. And part of what Faith was saying and why she decided to come on to this is that he still has followers too. Now, granted, it's a small group. I think he ended up with about 100, which sounds a lot like 
Herbal LeBaron, right? Mm -hmm. There was this big group. He broke off, started doing his stuff with about 100 followers. And there are so many similarities between Samuel Bateman, right? Taking all these yeah. wives, whoever he wants. And to see it always end up in the hurting of children just infuriates me. And I hope that they get him and he spends life in prison. Yeah, me too. And I think that he will at this point, I'm hoping. But it... It's so sad. And unfortunately, so many people are still following and believing in him and looking at him as this martyr that is now in prison. And Faith pointed out that, you know, it's they even believe in him stronger now. They believe even that he's a, a prophet even more now that he's in prison. And until recently, he was able to FaceTime his followers. Right. He was FaceTiming them. And so... That goes back to the, you know, people all the time are like, why can Warren Jeffs even like get a hold of his followers? And Samuel Bateman has followers too. He's allowed to do FaceTime. She said that recently stopped. Thank goodness. The other good news I will say is that Ludd got arrested for the abuse of minors in... Ludd is Faith's oldest brother. That gave multiple of his um, underage daughters to Samuel Bateman. Right. And he got arrested in 2023. So Samuel Bateman was arrested in 2022 in the fall, I believe. And then um, Ludd was arrested in 2023. So hopefully there will be justice served there and their followers will... I don't know. Hopefully see it, but you just never know. But... Right. Well, and I'm, I'm grateful that at least there's a small amount of people that actually did follow. I mean, it doesn't make it okay, that, but there aren't, it's not like thousands of people followed Sam Bateman. You're right. I mean, it was a, it was a hundred ish. Yeah. So hopefully as things unravel, it doesn't take long for all of them to just kind of fall away and then stop following Sam Bateman. Hopefully that's what we can hope for. But Faith was very upset with her older brother for going along with it. Mm -hmm. And I agree with her. How could a father give his underage girls, very underage girls, to marry someone that claimed to be a prophet? I don't know if he was in on it somehow or if he actually believed that strongly that, that Sam was a prophet. But uh, I don't know. It's, it's just sickening and I can't, I can't fathom how someone could. No, it's it's heartbreaking. Again, it's you see both sides of it in this episode, right? There's a lot of people, they're going to draw the line at their children, right? They're going to draw the line at horrible things happening to their kids. And then there's still some people where giving up their children is just another way for them to be able to prove their faith. And right. so it still can happen either way. And all we can do is hope and pray that other parents, that that's the line for them and they do everything they can to protect their children from the atrocities that are happening in these groups. Yes, thank you all so much for being here with us again today and thank you for helping us spread awareness. We really do appreciate all of your support and love and we look forward to talking with you soon. We'll talk to y'all soon.